Hello, everyone. Welcome to week three of our webinar series, Remote Sensing of Forest Cover and Change Assessment for Carbon Monitoring. My name is Amber McCollum, and I will be your instructor today along with two guest speakers from the USDA Forest Service, Grant Donkey and Ty Wilson. As a reminder, for this course, we'll have two sessions per week each Thursday. Please make sure you only sign up for and attend one of these session times. We have lectures, guest speakers, and um, hopefully time for uh, questions and answers at the end. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here. This includes past recordings, presentations, and homework assignments. We will also eventually have each of our presentation materials available in Spanish. If there are any additional questions, you can email me or my colleague, Cindy Schmidt, at the email addresses listed below. We have two homework assignments for this course. The first homework assignment is available on the website now, and it's due on June 30th. The second homework will be made available next week. We have also included the website where you can find the link to the homework in the chat. And I can provide that again if anyone needs it. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all your answers via Google Forms. You will receive an email receipt of the homework submission after the deadline for each homework. We will then send a, a separate answer key to all the participants that complete each homework after the final webinar. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend four out of five live webinars and complete all the homework assignments. It takes some time to process the certificates, so you can expect to receive those about three months after the completion of the course. We had one prerequisite for this course, um, basically knowing and understanding the fundamentals of remote, remote sensing. You can watch our on-demand course that's listed here, which includes two one-hour recorded webinars. As mentioned previously, you can access all the materials um, via the course website listed here. Um, please note that in order to view the webinar recordings after each session, you must enter your information again and um, register. Uh, this helps us keep track of who is viewing the online recordings. However, once you register, you'll automatically be taken to view the recording online. I also suggest um, to do this if you have any bandwidth issues um, throughout the presentation today. Here's an overview of the course agenda. Uh, this week we will be discussing carbon estimation techniques. The agenda for this week includes discussing the role of forest carbon monitoring, providing information about national forest inventories and how to identify the status of forests, establish trends, and how to maintain the sustainability of forests. We will discuss carbon stock estimation and reporting. We'll provide approaches for time series image processing and analysis, provide a use ca useful case study, and hopefully have time for questions and answers. If we do not get to any of your um, questions by the end of the uh, webinar today, we will be keeping track of these. And we are hoping to create a document where we can answer questions that may have not been addressed during this webinar. So now I will hand it over to our guest speakers from the USDA Forest Service. Our first speaker, Grant Domkey, will discuss forest carbon monitoring and reports in the U.S. Then we will hear from Ty Wilson, who will discuss national forest inventory data and satellite imaging for estimating emissions and removal. Thank you very much, Amber. Well, my name is Grant Domkey, and I'll be presenting the first few slides here in this presentation, and I'll be covering uh, broadly, the U.S. experience around forest carbon monitoring and reporting in the United States. I lead the uh, group uh, in the U.S. that compiles the emissions and removals uh, from the forest land category for uh, greenhouse gas reporting to the U.N. each year. And I'll be giving a, a broad overview of our experiences and also um, the work that we do here in the United States uh, to that end. 
So, so why are we interested in, in, in accounting for uh, carbon emissions and removals from the forest land category? Well, first of all, uh, forests in the United States account for around 86% of all annual sequestration uh, each year um, relative to the uh, six land use categories. And what this amounts to, at least for the 2016 inventory, is around uh, offsets around 11% of the total emissions, total CO2 emissions uh, for the nation. And what, what, what that amounts to is around uh, a sink of around 172 million metric tons of carbon uh, in 2016. So the role of carbon accounting. So in our group, uh, essentially what we do since we sit in the National Forest Inventory, the FIA program within the U.S., which is sort of the U.S., uh, the census of forests in the U.S., we collect information on around 125,000 forested plots. Uh, we, we take that data and convert it into information. We turn that into estimates of carbon and other forest attributes and then use that information in reporting instruments uh, to the United Nations, uh, to the U.S. Congress, uh, to uh, national forests within the Forest Service, and a variety of other national, international uh, reporting instruments. And the, the, the principal instrument that we report to, again, is this UN document that's compiled each year by the Environmental Protection Agency and then via the State Department is submitted to the United Nations. So within our group, we have sort of uh, an improvements paradigm that we work within and a set of sort of constraints or, um, uh, or ideas or ideals that we sort of adhere to. And really, um, given that we're reporting to the United Nations, we follow the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, good practice guidance for, uh, for national inventories. And a sort of guiding principle or phrase that we, we follow is that inventories should contain neither over nor underestimates so far as can be judged, and the uncertainties in those estimates should be reduced as far as is practicable. And so there's a set of tenets that we really, we really adhere to. And the fact that we sit in the National Forest Inventory means that we're trying to leverage in situ information, observations from the ground, wherever possible. And while doing that, also integrate auxiliary information, like remotely sensed information, which we'll be talking about today, but also uh, climate attributes and other variables that might be useful um, to identify and, uh, uh, drivers of change. We try to align national and international reporting instruments wherever possible so that uh, our reports are consistent and the estimates are consistent on an annual basis, and also align those instruments for um, reporting uh, uh, baseline to present information with projections uh, for a variety of different instruments as well. All the work that we do, we try to maintain transparency and open access. So all of the plot information in the United States is available, publicly available. Uh, and, and all of the methods that we use uh, to compile estimates in the greenhouse gas inventory are, are vetted through the peer-reviewed literature and are published. So you can, you can go out and find the, the, the methodology that we use um, for all of the different approaches uh, during that compilation process. We try to incorporate emerging science wherever possible, and that means working with partners and other folks uh, from universities, uh, other government, non-government agencies, um, to leverage uh, all the resources available to us uh, to sort of maintain sort of cutting edge science and, and accounting principles. We also are constantly trying to build new partnerships with, with uh, folks within the agency, but also universities, etc. Uh, uh, again, to, to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening out there and uh, maintain and improve the methods that, uh, that we're developing. And finally, we try to remain nimble to address ever-changing requests, uh, guidance, and stakeholder needs. So I thought up front I would, I would sort of define what we mean or what we're accounting for in the U.S. in terms of our greenhouse gas inventory report. And we only include managed lands. And, and by managed, I, I don't necessarily mean managed from a forest management perspective, but lands that um, are, are influenced in some way by human activity. So only those, uh, so only those lands are included in our UNFCCC reporting. All forest land in the uh, 
the conterminous United States is classified as managed and um, southeast and south central coastal Alaska uh, are currently considered in our managed land uh, definition. But I will say that uh, a recent analysis uh, uh, classifying uh, lands on the interior of Alaska have identified a whole suite of areas uh, that do meet that managed land definition and some of the techniques uh, and approaches that Ty will be discussing later uh, are being um, targeted uh, to uh, investigate those lands in the interior where uh, the FIA program, the National Forest Inventory, has not measured historically. And so there's a really broad definition, and actually it's, it's rather detailed, but a lengthy definition of, of forest land in the U.S., but it can really be boiled down to just a few, a few key points. It, there's got to be a minimum cover or stocking. It's got to be a minimum area. It has to, uh, the trees in that area, the site must be able to support uh, tree growth to a height of five meters. And we, we want that land to be considered a forest land use, not a, a, a land like a grassland or other land use. So typically it would be considered a forest land use if, if it meets those other criteria. I'm just going to give a brief overview of the National Forest Inventory, uh, the sampling frame, and, and Ty will go into a bit greater depth. So really it's a, a three-phased process. There's a pre-field phase where we use remotely sensed information to identify forest from non-forest. And those plots with at least a single uh, forested condition are then sent to the field. And when, when I say sent to the field, what I mean is uh, a field crew will go out and visit those plots uh, uh, and measure a variety of forest attributes. And those, those plots are uh, distributed approximately every 2,400 hectares. Uh, and then there's a set of intensive plots and, and those intensive plots, basically every 16th core plot is considered an intensive plot. And so in addition to the core plots where we measure things like a tree diameter, species, uh, tree heights, and a variety of site level attributes, those intensive plots, we measure additional attributes around standing and down dead wood, litter, soils, uh, understory vegetation, um, and a variety of other site and, and uh, component specific uh, attributes that are used in our carbon accounting. And so here's an example of the, the layout of the, the, the plot design. So on the left, or on your left, you will see sort of this hexagonal grid. Within each hexagon represents approximately 2,400 hectares. Within each hexagon, a plot is randomly located. And then you can see this sort of uh, scaled version of a plot. Each plot is uh, comprised of four subplots. And then within each subplot, a variety of uh, microplots and transects are included, particularly on those intensive uh, uh, plots to measure a variety of site and, and component attributes. So as I said, there are around 127,000 plots that have at least one forest condition in the US. And increasingly, we've been using not only the forested plots, but also non-forest plots, because during that pre-field phase, we collect a variety of information on, those, on, on all plots, including land use information in recent years. And so this is really important in terms of our reporting, because we're working with the other land use categories to make sure that we're not double counting and ensure that we're completely accounting for all carbon across all of the IPCC pools, which I'll describe in a minute, uh, on all land uses. So uh, in a nutshell, how we estimate things based on uh, the different attributes based on the NFI is we estimate a carbon density at the plot level for each plot. The carbon stocks are summed to total by inventory cycle, so for each year. And the stock change is essentially the difference between successive stocks divided by the time interval. So uh, a stock in, in 2015 minus a stock from 2014 would be the stock change for 20, 2014. And estimates develop, are developed separately for each state or region. And again, it's important to emphasize here that historically we've relied primarily on the NFI to compile uh, our, our greenhouse gas inventory estimates using the stock difference approach. 
The forest ecosystem carbon pools of interest are above ground live biomass, which includes um, live trees as well as understory, the above ground understory uh, material, below ground live biomass, which includes the coarse roots from uh, that woody material as well as the herbaceous material, dead wood, which includes both standing and downed dead. Uh, the litter material, which includes uh, the organic material above mineral soil, and then finally soil organic matter, which is the mineral soil. And we measure to a depth of 20 centimeters and use models to report to a depth of one meter. So here's the distribution of forest carbon stocks by pool in the U.S. Uh, based on the 2016 inventory, which was released back in April. You can see that the soil organic carbon is the largest contributor or, uh, to our total carbon stocks in the United States by a long shot, followed by above ground biomass and the litter material. And this is a, a spatial distribution of the carbon stocks in the US. You can see that there's a tremendous amount of carbon in the Pacific Northwest, so the uh, uh, part of the United States, as well as the northern lake states. In the Pacific Northwest, that's predominantly above ground biomass driving that, uh, the carbon stocks there, as well as uh, uh, substantial carbon stocks. And in the northern lake states, it's driven primarily by uh, soil carbon stocks. Here's a, a, essentially a breakdown over the entire reporting time series from 1990 to the present of all carbon stocks and also harvested wood products. So that's another part of the uh, forestry section within the land use, land use change and forestry chapter that we contribute to. And you can see here that uh, soils is primarily the, the, the main driver of uh, carbon stock change, or excuse me, above ground biomass is the main driver of carbon stock change on an annual basis. So sequestration, forest growth is really the, the major driver in, in carbon stock change, followed by the other carbon pools, and then to a lesser extent, the harvested wood products. And on an annual basis, on average over the time series, we've been sequestering between 180 and 200 million metric tons of carbon each year. And so this is a very iterative process. We, we began reporting uh, to the United Nations in 1992 and, and since that time have uh, made a number of improvements around the models that we use for pool, in the pool science field as well as the mechanism that we use to compile all of these estimates uh, and ultimately um, deploy those estimates as part of the greenhouse gas inventory report. Here's sort of a development timeline of, of how things started. As I said, things started in the early 1990s. And based on the 1998 Farm Bill, some legis uh, congressional legislation that occurred in the late 1990s, the periodic information that we were collecting as part of the National Forest Inventory uh, was, was uh, we made a transition to annual information. And, we st and also started collecting additional attributes around all of the different pools I just described. And so over the last 20 years or so, We've used that information, leveraged that annual information across all of the different uh, forest attributes to develop models for standing and down dead wood, litter, soils, understory, etc. And this timeline really illustrates the improvements that we made and that we continue to make. Most recently, uh, the soil organic carbon and litter pools. And we're currently in the process of developing a new accounting system which more fully integrates remotely sensed information, which we'll get into in a little bit. As part of that improvements timeline, uh, I, I said that we've continuously uh, refined the way in which we estimate uh, the different carbon pools or components within uh, the inventory. And recently we've updated the litter estimates based on in situ observations from those uh, intensive field plots. Historically we've used uh, literature values and again, following those sort of tenets that we, we sort of work within and, and sort of the mission of the group, we're constantly trying to leverage remotely sensed information as well as NFI information, in situ observations wherever possible to get estimates or, uh, or develop models 
that are sensitive uh, to the drivers of change. Just give you an example of some recent work around soil organic carbon. So historically, we've uh, used uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service pedons, which are predominantly uh, focused or located outside of forests, which this, uh, this graphic here illustrates. So you can see the blue pedons here. Uh, those are, are uh, essentially the, uh, the pedons that were used to develop the original soil organic carbon model. The gray area in this map is the forest land in the, in the Lake States region, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And the red uh, uh, points here are the National Forest Inventory plots. Well, you can see that those blue plots are, are, or pedons are, are essentially focused outside of forest land. So there was an inherent bias in, in the soil organic carbon model that we were using. And so between that and the fact that we have a nearly uh, complete and extensive inventory of soil organic carbon in the inventory now, we've begun leveraging that information in combination with a variety of auxiliary attributes to predict soil carbon across all plots in the U.S. And so this is the distribution of soil organic carbon plots. Um, we have roughly 5,000 plots uh, where we measure to a depth of 20 centimeters. And based on those plots and uh, integration of a variety of auxiliary attributes um, and information from uh, NRCS on forested plots to greater depths than that 20 centimeters, we've developed this new soil carbon map, uh, which reflects the estimates that we used in the 2016 inventory. Another major component of the work that we do is interact with the other land use categories, again, to ensure that we're not double counting and also uh, ensure that we are completely accounting for all carbon across all land uses, particularly the carbon that uh, tr is transferred or lost as a result of a land use change. And so these graphics here illustrate changes uh, in the carbon sink, the forest carbon sink, as a result of land use changes in the eastern United States. You can see that the uh, majority of loss land use change has occurred in croplands, and this has benefited uh, the forest land category, but also uh, many of the uh, uh, cropland, uh, much of the cropland area has also been converted to settlement, which is not surprising. So some of the ongoing and future work uh, that we're doing as, uh, you know, in, in, in an effort to improve our estimates within the greenhouse gas inventory. So historically, we've used uh, remotely sensed information to inform plots. And we're now starting to focus on moving from pixels and forming plots to plots and forming pixels, uh, leveraging all sorts of auxiliary remote sensing information. And one of those pieces of information that I think Ty will get into a bit uh, in a little bit, is uh, this dense time series of Landsat. And in particular, we're interested in this to attribute carbon flux to particular disturbances. So uh, while the National Forest Inventory is really useful at a strategic level, when we scale down, uh, the spatial and temporal resolution of those estimates um, uh, is not quite as refined as we would like. And so by incorporating remotely sensed information, we believe that we can have more produce more resolved estimates both spatially and temporally. We're also uh, leveraging LIDAR information and a variety of other auxiliary attributes to develop biomass maps and other products and increasingly are relying on uh, NAEP imagery from the National Agriculture Imagery Program uh, to begin looking at plots using aerial photography uh, to identify really fine scale changes on our plots and we believe that this information will be really helpful as we continue to build out our, our system for identifying uh, land use changes and uh, carbon stock changes as a result of those uh, changes. And so this is sort of a, a, a schematic or a, a graphic illustrating the direction that our carbon accounting system is going in the United States, where historically we've relied on a periodic uh, national forest inventory and annual inventory for the accounting system. We are now, now going to use those periodic and annual inventory data in combination with a suite of remotely sensed information 
to provide more spatially and temporally resolved estimates of carbon stocks and stock changes as well as their uncertainties uh, across the United States. So final thoughts on this sort of uh, broad perspective of, of the U.S. experience in greenhouse gas accounting and reporting uh, are that the National Forest Inventory remains the foundation of forest carbon estimates for the United States. Working on land conversions is a relatively new area for the United States and we're beginning to think more about uh, greenhouse gas monitoring and reporting as not a, a forest level or a, a forest land category but as a continuous system that includes all land uses. And we must work with those other land use categories to ensure internal consistency in terms of the methods that we're using in our accounting across the various forest or across the different land use pools and also that we avoid double counting and ensure complete accounting. And so with that, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Ty Wilson, who will go in uh, to some details around some of the remotely sensed or remote sensing efforts that we're currently working on. Great, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Grant, for providing the, uh, the context for what I'm about to present. Uh, that was a really excellent uh, overview of uh, the carbon reporting process. Uh, so I will uh, spend some time now uh, maybe digging into the weeds a little bit and talking about the use of uh, satellite imagery for improving the uh, precision of our estimates of carbon emissions and removals. So here's an outline of what I'll present. Uh, first, I'll just give a little bit of background information on IPCC guidance regarding carbon uh, reporting. Uh, I will just talk very briefly again about the National Forest Inventory of the United States, the, the FIA program that Grant uh, spent some time talking about there. Uh, and then I'll uh, talk in a little bit more detail about uh, the use of dense time series satellite imagery, namely uh, Landsat in this case. And I will give a, a worked example from a research study that uh, we have been conducting on how we might be able to uh, improve the precision of our, our estimates using this, uh, this information in conjunction with the NFI data. And then I'll talk about uh, the results, the preliminary results from the research study using these different approaches. So first, uh, talking about IPCC guidance uh, on NFI. Uh, basically the guidance is that uh, NFI data are not really required but they can be used uh, for uh, carbon reporting. This would be an example of using design-based sampling or design-based inference for making population estimates. And in this case with an NFI we would have multiple measurements or at least in the case of a continuous NFI we would have multiple measurements of the same plots over time which would give us some information about change. So from this change information we would be able to estimate emissions or removal factors for any of our uh, red plus strata as uh, Grant just described. This is an example of a tier three approach to the above ground carbon pool uh, relative to, I think you maybe discussed uh, the tiers in the previous, uh, one of the previous presentations. And primarily for the NFI, we're really talking about the, the main focus is on forest land that remains forest land, less, uh, less so on uh, land use change but we will talk a little bit about that. And this would be an example of a, a stock change approach rather than a gain loss approach. And again, hopefully you've discussed this in a previous presentation. With the gain loss approach, we would be uh, estimating uh, activity data first for these would be uh, examples of uh, changes from one land use to another. Uh, or perhaps land uses remaining in that land use category. And then we would have some uh, emissions uh, factors or removal factors associated with those, uh, with those activity data. And then it would be a simple matter of uh, multiplying your activity data by your emissions factors to get your total removals or emissions. In the case of stock change, it's all based on these uh, observations of change uh, that come from the, the, the sample of plots. 
given that that Grant did such a great job discussing this, I'm not sure how much time I'll spend on the the uh, National Forest Inventory of the U.S., which is the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program. As he said, this is a Forest Service program, um, and uh, the the main purpose is really to report on forest status and trends across the United States. This is really intended to be a strategic survey. So we would be reporting on uh, trends, say, at the state or maybe maybe a sub-state level, but nothing much smaller than that. That's really not the purpose. So this is a national program. However, it's, uh, it's implemented regionally, which can lead to some issues. However, we've developed a, developed a set of common standards for implementing this inventory across the four uh, regions uh, in the United States. We have a northern region, southern, intermountain west, and Pacific Northwest region. And that allows us to uh, customize, well, while we have this common sampling frame, common field collection protocols, we're able to uh, tweak the sample uh, or tweak the protocols to address regional concerns. So as Grant said, we have a common sampling frame uh, where we have one plot uh, installed per every 2,400 hectares. Uh, this information is collected across a five to ten year cycle depending upon what part of the country that you're in. Uh, this would be an example of a, a quasi-systematic sample. Uh, we basically are uh, putting in a plot inside this, uh, you saw this hexagonal mesh that uh, Grant showed in a previous slide and we install a plot in each of those hexagons, but not necessarily in the center because we want to maintain uh, plot security, plot confidentiality, and uh, sample integrity. Uh, so here's sort of a, a, a recap of what, what Grant had presented before. Our sampling frame is based on a hexagonal tessellation of the, the land base. If you could imagine a, uh, a soccer ball, at least the old-fashioned kind of soccer ball that was made up of hexagonal and pentagonal patterns uh, or panels. If you were, if you had a large enough soccer ball that could enclose the earth and you arranged it in such a way that one of those hexagons covered uh, the uh, contiguous United States, which you see here in the middle, uh, the middle of this uh, this this figure. Uh, and then you were to subdivide that into smaller and smaller hexagons, you would basically have our, our sampling frame. And then in each of those hexagons, we would install one of these permanent plots, as Grant described it before. It's, it's basically a cluster of four, four different subplots. But I, I, I won't talk in much more, more detail about that. And then again, on each one of these plots, we will uh, collect some information that's associated with the plot as a whole, like for example, its, its location in terms of latitude and longitude, the elevation of the plot. And then on each plot, there would be one or more conditions, which would be basically be areas that have similar land cover, ownership, or, or stand age. Uh, and we'd collect other information like slope or any indication of disturbance on the plot. And then in turn, on each condition, there might be one or more trees. And for each of those trees, we would, again, uh, make some observations, such as the status of the tree. Is it alive or is it dead? What's the species of the tree? We'd measure its diameter at breast height. Uh, we'd estimate its height and uh, any indication of damage on the tree. So those are some of the examples of, of the field measurements that we would make on the plot or in different parts of the plot. And in addition to these uh, observed attributes, there are a series of uh, modeled attributes that we compute later uh, using our uh, database compilation system where we would do things like on the condition level, we would uh, type the forest. Uh, we would compute volume for each tree based on our, uh, our allometric equations and, and models. Uh, and from those, we would derive things like uh, biomass, or in the case of this, this particular study, uh, carbon, different carbon pools. Now ultimately we are, while the plot information is, is interesting, ultimately what we're interested in doing is using the sample uh, to say something about the population as a, as a whole. We, we can't, of course, take a complete census. The estimates that we make for the population are based on this sample, so there will be some error associated with that. So this is, again, an example of design-based inference. 
where the source of uncertainty in these estimates will be uh, basically whether or not a population unit is in our sample or not in our sample. That's where the uncertainty comes in. And that, of course, is going to be determined by the sample design. The sample design that I showed you basically gives us a measure of the probability of any population unit being included in the sample or not. And then we use this information with post-stratified estimators to make uh, unbiased estimates about the population, which is what we're really interested in. And so for each of our strata, we come up with design weights. And those, are, those, will be, those weights will be the same within each stratum. Basically, it's like an expansion factor. Each plot represents a certain amount of land uh, within a stratum without getting into too much detail. And we can use uh, the sample then to make estimates of what's the current state of the forest or if we, in the case of multiple observations of plots over time, then we can say something about change in the landscape. We're talking about a gain loss approach uh, from the NFI alone. So this would just be based upon uh, the, the plots, the sample of plots uh, and the information we collect on those. So this would be not using a map at all, no auxiliary information is used. Another approach would be to use the gain loss approach, and uh, but with the stratified estimator. Uh, this is a little slightly different than the post stratified estimation that I was discussing earlier, and I'll get into this in a little more detail in a in a little bit here. Uh, and this would use a map, but it would use a thematic map, so some sort of classification of the landscape basically into activity data. And uh, like I said, we'll talk about this in a little more detail in a bit. And then finally, we could use a stock change approach with a model-assisted regression estimator. This also uses a map, but in this case it would be a continuous map. So uh, let's, let's dig into this in a little more detail. So these two examples, the gain loss approach with the stratified estimator and the stock change approach with the model assisted regression estimator, they both use auxiliary information. They use basically maps but in different forms. So first I'll talk about the auxiliary information that, uh, that we are using or that we are planning to use. I think uh, uh, Grant talked a little bit earlier. He talked about kind of the, the state of where we are and where we would like to be. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about kind of where we'd like to be in the future using um, dense time series imagery. In this case, uh, for this, this study area, I'm talking about Landsat 7, Enhanced Thematic Mapper Plus data. And I think you talked about this maybe uh, in your last uh, weekly webinar where you talked about remote sensing platforms. So Landsat 7, as you hopefully all know, uh, collects information in, in eight bands. Uh, the spatial resolution or the pixel resolution of the data is anywhere from 15 to 60 meters. Uh, here's uh, a table that describes the band widths and the uh, ground sampling density uh, in meters of the pixels that uh, the pixel information and it's collected in those different bands. And that information is collected, basically any spot on the ground is revisited every 16 days. So I'm going to talk about a, uh, a data set. It's, again, based on Landsat, but a lot of pre-processing has already been done. This is particularly useful uh, for us in the United States, but actually I think now this data has been made available globally. Uh, maybe just not at the same temporal resolution as what uh, I'm showing here. But it's a, it's a website and data set called WELD, which is the Web Enabled Landsat Data Set. And this is a, a joint venture between uh, NASA, USGS, and South Dakota State University. This data has been pre processed in a number of ways. It's been ortho rectified, it has been uh, basically recalibrated from, uh, from digital numbers, raw digital numbers, to top, top of atmosphere reflectance, which is a typical pre-processing uh, step that most people would have to do, but it's been done for you. And finally, the data have been composited into a number of different uh, compositing bins, but in my case I'm using the monthly composites, which means uh, for every spot on the ground, or, or for at least for my study area, 
uh, we've taken all of the collections within one month and, uh, and uh, produced a composite image from that for that month. So the weld record is, uh, is a decade of images. That decade spans from 2003 to 2012, which is particularly convenient for us in the FIA program because that spans, at least for my study area, that spans two five-year FIA cycles, which means that I will have uh, observations of plots at two points in time so I can start to look at change over time. So I'm using one weld tile. You can, uh, you can download tiles that are 5,000 by 5,000 pixels. These are roughly, uh, that's roughly the size of a, a Landsat scene, maybe a little bit smaller. Uh, so my study area, or for this particular uh, example, is one tile. I see somebody who's raised their hand here. Okay, it looks like maybe maybe that was addressed. Somebody else has raised a hand here. Amber, should I try to? Okay, I'll just I'll skip these for now. Uh, I think we'll get to those in a little bit. So we have one tile. You can see here. This is located in. Um, yeah, there is a link to the Weld website on the slide. Uh, so we can see that. Uh, you can see that later. Um, so we're working with one weld tile in Wisconsin. Uh, this is a really complex landscape in terms of uh, Lulu CF, that's land use, land use change in forestry. There's a lot of interesting things that have been going on in that landscape over this 10 year period. So we will, um, uh, we'll, we'll look at that in a little more detail in a bit. But because we're working with dense Landsat time series, in this case monthly composite data, we're, and we're working with Landsat 7, we've got a couple of issues that we're going to have to deal with. One of the issues is, of course, clouds. Uh, and then also there's missing data due to the fact that the uh, Landsat 7, in the case of Landsat 7 sensor, the ETM Plus sensor, the scanline corrector conked out in 2003. And the scanline corrector is really just a small mirror that helps to compensate for the forward motion of the spacecraft. And so when that conked out, it, it resulted in some, uh, some of these wedges of no data that's more apparent as you get further uh, from Nader, which is directly beneath the sensor. So you can see that on the right there. That's an example showing you before and after of the, the Bay Area around San Francisco and California. So that's one issue that we're going to have to deal with, are these data, data gaps. Another issue that we'll have to deal with is the fact that since we're especially interested in vegetation in this case, and we know that vegetation is seasonal, responds to, uh, to the, the, the weather, to the light environment, uh, there is seasonality. And we're showing an example of that here. This information comes from the Wide Area Monitoring Information System, which is a WAMIS. Um, and this shows, you can see there's a, there's a crosshairs there, uh, there's a little plus, a yellow plus that shows a point on the landscape. And what I'm showing there on the right is, uh, is a time series of EVI, this is from MODIS, and this is showing you the seasonality for that point on the ground over the course of, oh, it looks like roughly 10 years or so. So it's very clear that there's seasonality in the spectral response, or in, the case, in this case, it's a vegetation index. Uh, so we have to account for that if we're talking about change, because it depends on when we've made the observation. So the question is, how do we handle the gaps in the data that are due to the scanline corrector or clouds? How do we characterize these seasonal patterns? Well, one thing that we can do is use something called harmonic regression. So we can do harmonic regression of the monthly composites. So what you see down there, this, this image sequence is showing you, rather than seasonality for one point, like I showed you in the previous slide, this is showing you seasonality across the entire, uh, in, across CONUS. I think the image on the left is from uh, January, and then the one in the middle is in March, and the one on the right is, I think it's May, June. So you can actually see that different parts of the landscape and different cover types green up and then senesce at different, different rates. So that's uh, important information for us to uh, account for. 
So harmonic regression, uh, in a nutshell, it involves uh, the use of a Fourier series. So the Fourier series equation isn't too, too scary. It's, uh, it's really just a summation of sine and cosine terms. So you, what you're doing with a Fourier series is then you're approximating any periodic function. So here's an example. This is using, uh, this is using a, a Fourier series to approximate a square wave. So you see the square wave there in black, and then the colored uh, curves that you see there are uh, Fourier series that have been fit to that, uh, that square wave with different numbers of harmonics. So as you add more harmonics to the series, you can more closely approximate the periodic function. So this is exactly what we're going to do with the Landsat uh, monthly composites. Another transformation that we're going to do to the data is we're going to transform the raw ETM plus bands into tasseled cap. Uh, this is a very common transformation that's done with Landsat data uh, and it's to make the, uh, those raw bands into something that's more, more meaningful to the analyst. So the reason that they call it tasseled cap is because if you imagined viewing it in three dimensions, it kind of looks like a cap. It looks like a, maybe Peter Pan's hat or Robin Hood's cap. Uh, so you can see here, uh, tasseled cap is uh, broken down in terms of brightness and greenness and wetness. And so we see that here on the x-axis is the brightness, band, or brightness component. On the y-axis, it's the greenness component, and on the z-axis, it's the wetness component. So you can see uh, a dark green blob there, uh, kind of resting on top of the cap. That would represent forests. Uh, that's what uh, forests look like in terms of the tassel cap transformation. That's where you'd find them in this feature space of, of three dimensions, or in this case, I'm looking at these two dimensions. And then that large triangle of light green would basically be cropland. And then the brown sliver along the bottom would be either bare soil or like rangeland. And then that blue, uh, that small blue circle over to the left would be water. And then the big gray kind of uh, oval uh, to the right would represent uh, urban or built up areas. So you can see, depending upon the land cover, uh, they occupy different places in this feature space, in this tasseled cap feature space. So that's information that we will pull in as well. So what we're going to do is, uh, is use the tasseled cap transformation to brightness, greenness, and wetness. And then we'll look at these monthly composites of tasseled cap, brightness, greenness, and wetness, and fit a Fourier series to each of those. And we're only going to use two harmonics per series because we really the main purpose here is to, is to capture the overall seasonality of the data, we don't necessarily care about capturing every little bump or jag or wiggle in the time series. We want to get the overall trend. So in this case, I've got uh, two five-year periods that I'm going to fit uh, Fourier series to. So I've got two 60-month periods, right? I've got monthly data and five years, so that's 5 times 12 is 60 months per period. And then I've got three tasseled cap components. I've got five Fourier series, the FS is Fourier series, coefficients uh, per series. When you use two harmonics, it results in uh, five coefficients that you're estimating. And I've got two time periods. So in the, in the end, I'm going to be, basically, I'm going to wind up with 30 features that I can use to, um, to do my, my modeling or my uh, classification of the landscape. So we have one more issue that we have to deal with is because I want to use this Landsat information with the NFI data, which is the National Forest Inventory data uh, for, from FIA, is that the FIA plots are actually larger than uh, Landsat pixels. And here is a, here is a uh, figure that shows that. You can see the relative size of the FIA plot to a Landsat pixel. So a simple solution for dealing with this spatial mismatch would be just to use the mean spectral response of a 3 by 3 window centered on the, the center subplot. So here's some results. So this is, um, in this case, I'm using, this is time period one. So this would be from 
the period of 2003 to 2007. And what I'm showing you here in this RGB image, so red, green, blue image, is the mean brightness, greenness, and wetness for my, my uh, weld tile. And you can see here very clearly that uh, there are some, uh, some different land covers here. So what you see in blue would be, that's high in wetness, right? So those would be water bodies. And you can see, for example, uh, some lakes in the northern part or the upper part of this image. Uh, and then red would be brightness. So that would be like bare, bare soil. Um, so you see that in the agricultural areas, which are mostly in the southwest part of the image. And then green, high in greenness, would be, uh, would be forest land. And so that's what you see kind of throughout the northern half of this image. So we can clearly see some different uh, land covers in this landscape. And here it is in time period two. And uh, it might be hard to see, but we'll come back to this in a little bit. There have been some changes between time period one, which was 2003 to 2007, and then time period two, which is 2008 to 2012. So we'll focus on those changes in a little bit. So here is an example of a thematic map of change. So I just used those 30 features that we identified by using the tasseled cap transformation and the, and the harmonic regression Fourier coefficients. Uh, and I've done a simple ISO data classification, which is a, uh, which is a, a fairly commonly used unsupervised classification approach on all of these 30 features. And then I've gone in and I have uh, assigned labels to the, the classes that, uh, that, I've, uh, that I've categorized here, right? So you can see some things like, for example, that little red slash over on the right side of the image. That is actually a, a, a tornado track. There was a tornado event in 2007 uh, right in the middle of this time series, a major disturbance event. And you can see that clearly in this classification. And then you can see some small patches of red kind of in the northern part of the image. Uh, those are harvests in kind of industrial forest land areas. Uh, and then there are also some, some uh, blue and black uh, pixels in there that you see as well. And those are regrowth after previous harvests. So again, kind of coming back to that IPCC guidance, we're really focused now on this second piece. This is the gain loss approach with the stratified estimator using a thematic map. And that's the thematic map that I've created there, just using unsupervised classification of those features that I've derived from the imagery. So before I talk about that next piece, we have to talk about moving from design-based inference, which I talked about before, to model-based inference. In model-based inference, we can borrow strength basically from units outside of the sample. And this is useful when we have auxiliary information for units outside of our sample, like we do with satellite imagery. This can result in some major reductions in the variance of our estimates, but it really depends upon the strength of the relationship between the auxiliary variable and the variable of interest. And there also is, because we're, we're creating a model here, there is the potential for bias, but we can actually correct for that if we can estimate what the bias is. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about, about models is from uh, George Box, the statistician, who said, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So I think that's important to keep in mind is that we, we, we kind of go into this knowing that the model is wrong in some way, as all models are, but that doesn't mean that it's not a useful approach. So since we're talking about uh, models here, we have to define what the response variable of the model is. So because we are working with uh, satellite imagery, and with satellite imagery, we can really only detect land cover. We can't, at least directly, measure land use. It would be useful to use a response variable that's somehow um, associated with land cover. So tree canopy cover, of course, in, in, in our case, we're interested in forests. We know that tree canopy cover is going to be uh, somehow related to the basal area of trees. Basal area, for those of you who don't know, is basically if you were to take a measurement 
of the diameter at breast height. If you could slice through the tree at that point and you could measure the area of the stump, uh, that resulting stump, that would be the basal area. And we know that that area is, uh, is going to be closely related to the canopy. And the canopy, of course, is what we're detecting at satellite. So for the purposes of this uh, kind of this worked example here, I'm going to use that just as a proxy for above ground carbon. I guess I, I could have used the above ground carbon measurement because that is a modeled, uh, I shouldn't say measurement. I could have used that attribute, which is a uh, modeled attribute in our database. But just to kind of keep it simple and not add too many models on top of models, I'm just going to use basal area as my proxy. And so for my small study area, that 5,000 by 5,000 pixel area, I've got 1,446 plots that have been remeasured between 2003 and 2012. So in this case, I need a predictor variable. So I'm just, this is more to kind of give folks a flavor for the kinds of uh, analysis that, um, that you might do with, uh, with uh, imagery with remotely sensed imagery, a very common uh, approach to working with multivariate data is principal components analysis. So it's another kind of transformation. It's actually very closely related to the um, tasseled cap transformation that we saw before, and it results in standardized and orthogonal components. Uh, which means that there should be no correlation between one component and the next, which is important when we fit a model. We, we want to deal with that multicollinearity of our predictor variables. And uh, really useful, uh, it's really useful in the case if you wanted to reduce the size of your predictor data set but maintain most of the variance that you see, um, like in this case, we can account for 93% of the variance that we see in the predictor data set just using the first eight principal components. So we can shrink the size of our predictor data set considerably without giving up too much information. So here's an example back to that uh, study area. In this case, it's a, this is an RGB image again, but now I'm showing you principal components one, two, and three. And again, you can see here, these are the principal axes of variability in my uh, my satellite imagery, my multi-temporal satellite imagery. And what we can see here is that um, the agricultural areas in the southwest show up very clearly as being either kind of red or orange or yellow in this, uh, in this RGB image. And water bodies are kind of this light blue, which you can see. Uh, and interestingly now, you can see that forest land can uh, be differentiated into uh, deciduous and evergreen. So evergreen forests would show up in green here, and uh, deciduous forests would show up in purple. And then also there are a few other uh, cover types here, like uh, wetlands, which show up as sort of a, a pink color. If I choose instead to view um, some different principal components, if I look at components 1, 5, and 7, now we can actually see not, not the axes of greatest variability, but the principal axes of change. And so that tornado track on the uh, kind of the eastern edge of the image is very apparent now that it, it appears as kind of a light light blue, sort of a cyan color there, as well as those uh, those industrial forest lands that we saw before in the uh, in the classified image, uh, we can see those as well. So we are clearly detecting some change between those two time periods. So I don't want to go into too much detail on the, the model. We could really do this with any sort of model. I wanted to keep it really simple. So in this case, I'm using a KNN estimator. So the KNN estimator is it's a non-parametric approach to modeling. It doesn't make any real assumptions about the relationship between the predictor variables and the response variable in this case. And it really just means that we're going to use uh, the weighted average of the k nearest neighbors to any pixel. And in this case, I'm not talking about nearest pixels 
in terms of geographic space, I'm talking about nearest in terms of feature space. So remember before I described that there were 30 features that I've derived from the satellite imagery. So that forms a, a 30 dimensional space and if I use principal components analysis maybe I can get that down to an 8 dimensional space and it's those 8 dimensions in which I'm measuring proximity. So that's, that's what I mean when I say nearest neighbor. It's nearest in that space. So using the KNN estimator and just the weighted average of the nearest K, in this case K was something like uh, I want to say 15. So I'm saying what's the weighted average of the 15 nearest neighbors to every pixel in that feature space. If I can pull in the plot information from those nearest uh, the plots that are nearest in that feature space, I can come up with an estimate. And that's what I've done here. And so this shows you change in basal area between time period 1 and time period 2. So here you can see uh, changes, which would be so reductions in basal area would show up in red or yellow. Um, no change would be kind of a light green or a, a greenish blue or greenish blue yellow. And then uh, positive changes, so increases in basal area would show up in blue.
sensing and particularly pixel size was not a uh, probably top of mind at the time that the, uh, the plot design was established, but that's a very good question. Um, uh, the size of the workforce that carries out this sampling and how many plots are typically sampled each year? Uh, great question. Um, so uh, the, the Forest Service works with um, both uh, Forest Service employees, contractors, and state partners to measure plots. Uh, as I think Ty alluded to, in the eastern U.S., we measure plots, um, uh, re-measure plots every five years, and in the western U.S., uh, it's every ten years. And so um, I, I don't know exactly the number of personnel uh, per se, but I think there's right around um, 100 folks in the east, 100 uh, field crew members in the east that are measuring, yeah, in the northern region anyway. Um, which is a about 24 states and then that across those 24 states, we're measuring around 20% of the plots each year. So those 100 folks are measuring about 100 plots each year. Uh, I, I see some questions here. Uh, this is Ty uh, regarding the KNN estimator. Uh, so yeah, so that is KNN stands for K nearest neighbor, and it is a very it's a very simple model basically. Uh, once you have your feature space. Uh, and you find uh, the K nearest, where K is something that you would define as the analyst, uh, you would just use a simple weighted average of attributes from those nearest. In this case, it would be, it would be plots. If, if you guys, uh, I see folks are asking for references to that, I would be happy if you, if you would just send me um, an email. I can provide you with um, some citations and references to the use of the KNN estimator. It's been uh, used quite a bit in Scandinavia and in the U.S. For, for, for quite a few years now. So it's a pretty well established method for using, uh, for using our NFI data. One of the main benefits, which I didn't really touch upon, is the fact that because you would use the same set of neighbors, uh, you would basically be able, it's a multivariate approach to modeling, which means you would get all of the uh, attributes associated with the plot not just one of them. So if I were interested in, say, uh, above ground uh, tree carbon, I could look up that attribute associated with those K nearest neighbors and take the, way, the, the average. Um, if I'm interested instead in biomass, I could just look that attribute up instead. So it's, it's a nice, uh, efficient way of linking a map to uh, our, our database of plot information. It's, uh, they, they refer to that as imputation. Um, let me just kind of, I want to make sure I get to a few more of the questions here. Uh, let's see, I saw something up here. Uh, you want to answer this one about annual removal factor? Oh, uh, no, uh, <laughs> not necessarily. Um, so, so, yeah, so there are emissions and removal factors, and I think Ty touched on one way that you can uh, calculate those emissions and removal factors from a map or from an NFI. Um, there are also default emission factors that are available through IPCC good practice guidance that can be used um, uh, with that activity data to uh, compile estimates in much the same way that was described here, where you might not have NFI or, or other information to inform those emissions and removal factors. I also saw that there was a question here about the Canon estimator. Oh, yeah. Discrete data or continuous. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I see that question too now. Um, yeah, you could actually use it for either. Um, so in my case, I used it for continuous data. But you could instead, uh, that weighted average, it, it basically uh, could then amount to a series of votes. And each, each of those nearest neighbors basically votes one way or another. So for example, if you wanted to use the uh, plot observations of land cover or land use, 
you could basically then use uh, each of those plots casts a vote. If that nearest neighbor was categorized as uh, cropland, uh, if, if more of them say it's cropland than say it is uh, forest land, then you would classify it as cropland. So yes, you can definitely use it for discrete data as well. There are some uh, studies that suggest you might want to increase the value of K if you're producing a categorical map rather than a continuous map. Um, looking else, uh, let's see, what else here? Um, uh, Do you want to say something about that? Sure. Uh, so there's a question here. Can you elaborate a bit on this statement, moving from pixels and forming plots to plots and forming pixels? So under the current framework that we use in the greenhouse gas inventory, and actually that we use within the National Forest Inventory, we use satellite imagery, remotely sensed information, uh, or products uh, derived or obtained from remotely sensed information to stratify our population, our estimates, uh, which is essentially a variance reduction mechanism. It reduces our overall uh, variance. And, and that's the way that we've, we've incorporated remotely sensed information to this point in time. What we're proposing is that we would begin to use the plot-based information to inform the, the, the pixels, to inform what's, ha what's going on in each pixel uh, to arrive or develop emission factors for each of those pixels. So really kind of flipping flipping the use of that remotely sensed information on its head. Someone also uh, asked a question about lo uh, loss of information due to the, the stripes from the scanline corrector off condition. Uh, yes, that is true, but however, using the, the Fourier series and harmonic regression, you're actually able to recapture a lot of that information from that, from that model. Uh, if I wanted, I could probably create then uh, sort of a modeled, um, uh, like let's say we were interested in uh, vegetation index or NDVI over time. You could then produce an NDVI image at any, any point in time. And of course, again, like we talked about before, it would be a model and therefore it would be wrong, uh, but we could estimate the bias in that model. So while, yes, there is some missing data there, um, we, the, the, the Fourier series helps to recapture some of that information. It's more problematic if the missing data happens to be at the, at the peak or, or at the, uh, either the, the, the maximum or minimum in the series. That's when it's more problematic. Uh, and there's really not a lot that uh, we can do about that. But if the data is missing at any other point in the uh, time series, the uh, the Fourier series does a really nice job of uh, of filling that in. Yeah. Sorry, we're just trying to quickly answer as many of these as we can here. Um, is there anything else in here? Oh, uh, could you explain a little bit more about how you solve the spatial, spatial mismatch? Yeah, so the way, again, the way I did that was um, uh, to compute the, uh, t the mean spectral response for a 3x3 three three window centered on my cent central plot, uh, central subplot location. So uh, there is this, in uh, image processing software, there's a, there's a fairly common function which allows you to compute zonal stats where you define basically a kernel uh, around each location and it can compute, you can determine the size of that, uh, that kernel. It could be any shape you want, it doesn't have to be square, it could be circular, whatever. But we found that it, it worked really well to just use uh, the 3x3 three three window. And so we run this filter over the entire image and then we extract the information from that filtered image before we fit our model. So I, I hope that uh, that helps a little bit. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Ty and Grant, again, for uh, the really informative presentation and um, for joining us today and answering our questions. Um, and thank you all for joining. Just as a reminder, next week we will be discussing accuracy assessments. And um, we will have our, our guest speaker, Pontus Olfelsen from Boston University. So um, thank you. Thank you all again.